Hi everyone, today we'll talk about extrusion. Um, you can use extrusion to make uh, a variety of different um, products. You can make uh, pipes, you can make uh, films, you can also extrude uh, cereals or lots of uh, food product. Well, the first thing we'll talk about is to look at the extruder, the main components of an extruder. First of all, you need to have a hopper. This is where you're going to load your plastics. Under the hopper, you have the cooling lines. The reason we have cooling lines here is because we want to prevent the melting of the pallets. Otherwise, the, once the pallets melt, they will block the feeding zone. Then we'll have a barrel, and you can see that used to uh, use as the enclosure of the screw. This is the screw. Um, on the barrel, we have the heaters, and we also have a die. And the product generally we call is extruded, and we can divide the extrusion into three zones: solid convey zone, transition zone, and the pump pumping zone. And we'll talk about these zones uh, later on. In the industry, they also use a so-called screen pack, and there's two functions. One is to fill out the contamination. The second is to improve mixing. But at the same time, you need to know that if you use a screen pack, you could also raise up the pressure and the temperature of your polymer melt. And this is uh, uh, how the screen pack looks like. It's like the meshes, right? All right. Um. Well. There's a uh, industry here, a company here in Chippewa Falls. The extruding dies. They make extruding dies, and you can make uh, all sorts of a product depending on the die you um, designed. Generally, for example, you could have a, make a flat films, and generally they are thinner than 0 0.01 inch. Or you can make a sheet that they are thicker than 0 0.01 inch. And you can make pipes, mm -hmm. and you can make a profile with a hollow, solid object, depending, really depending on the die you designed. All right, this is a school geometry, and a few important parameters that I need you to know. The first one is the clearance. Do you see? Basically, that's a little gap between the barrel and your school uh, flight, and it's very small. The second is this so-called channel depth. They tell you how high the the height of your uh, materials, um, particularly in the pumping zone. And this is the distance between screws, and this is the width of your screws. This is helix angle generally is about seventeen degree. And the LD ratio people often refer to is this L, the length between screws and your screw diameter. This is the detailed table about the school geometry you can uh, refer to later. So generally, we have a single school extruder and a twin school extruders, and then we have both types in the in our plastics lab. For twin school extruders, you know they are good for compounding and mixing. For example, if you need to make a composite or blend, you know you will uh, make them through uh, twin school extruders. And when you use twin school extruder, generally we need to have a degas zone to release the the gas between the pallets. Depending on how uh, the two screws rotate reference to each other. You could have a cold rotating uh, twin screw extruder or counter rotating. For the cold rotating uh, twin screw extruder, generally they provide a higher shear rate and give you a better mixing. While the, if you use a counter rotating, you need to be cautious about possible the, um, the higher pressure build up. All I need you to learn from this slide is to know that uh, twin screw extruder is better for mixing and compounding. This is how we describe extrusion process. First of all, you load your raw material or polymers into the hopper. Then your polymer is transported, melted, or mixed. Then it is they are uh, being popped through a shaping die. Then your product is cooled to maintain a new shape, and this process is continuous. 
Now let's first look at the, the feeding zone, or it is called the solvent convey zone. This zone, it uses the friction. It uses the friction between the barrel and the pallet to transport the resin forward. So you need to make sure the friction uh, is higher than the pressure force generated at the die entry. Otherwise, the material is going to go backward. So for some pallets, some polymer, they are having um, low coefficient of friction, generally will um, have a grooved friction uh, to just to increase the friction, the friction uh, to move the, to transport the pallets. And this is the feeding zone. For the transition zone, generally this is where the material gets melted and the heat is supplied um, from the heater band and from the shear stress. The, the, the heater band generally only contribute to about 25% of the total heat. The majority of the heat, roughly 75%, is supplied through the heat, shear heating or shear stress. The mechanism of the melting is, first of all, you have this solid bed. Do you see this? This is a solid bed. Once the pallets are melted, they will form a film on the top, on the top, and then the film will get put into a so-called melt pool, and this is how the pallets is, are being melted um, during the transition zone. The last zone is the metering zone or pumping zone. Again, you need to make sure the friction uh, force is higher than the pressure force generated in order to make sure the material to moving forward. And the screw diameter uh, typically tell you the pumping capacity of your extruder. All right, so earlier we talked about the viscosity, which is a very important parameter to affect the quality of your processing, and viscosity depends on the shear rate. So now I want to talk a little bit about the shear rate and pressure drop calculations that you could use to estimate what's going on uh, inside the, the, uh, the extruder and in the die areas. So first of all, this is for estimating the shear rate in the school uh, in the extruder screw channels, and it is related to, for example, your screw diameters, your RPM, and your channel depth. And if you know all these parameters, you can easily calculate the shear rate the material is experiencing inside the extruder. Now, when we talk about when, we, when, they are, when the material is in the die channel, we have a little bit different equations to calculate the, the, uh, the shear rate. For example, it's related to the Q, that's a volumetric output, and the big W, which is the geometry of your die, and D is your die channel height. And also then, you can estimate the pressure drop, which is a similar version, but uh, you need to, here is you need to pay attention, which is the viscosity of your pallets at that shear rate. And I will give you examples on how to use these equations. Um, here, for example, if you are, you are going to extrude two plas plastics, material one, here in the dash line and material two, and this is the viscosity plotted as a function of a shear rate. And I have four questions below the plot um, for you to think about it. Um, so first, the first one is how the two material differ in terms of a shear rate dependence. And you can see that the material two show very clear linear dependence or log rate, log rhythmic dependence on the shear rate. Well, the material Y initially at a low shear rate, the uh, viscosity constant then gradually decreases with the increase in your shear rate. The second question is, which one would produce a larger pressure drop in the die channel? Uh, if you remember, the pressure drop is proportional to the viscosity of your plastic melt. And you can see overall, material one has a higher viscosity, so apparently material one will produce a larger pressure drop. The third question is, given the same extruding condition, which one would need more work or torque? Again, because the material one has a higher risk, has a higher risk of the, definitely the motor behind the extruders will need to work harder to extrude the material one. So yes, material one would need more work torque. 
Now the question come to third, the last one. How would you do to lower the viscosity of a material, especially material one? Ah,、uh, if you look at the trend, right? If you increase your shear rate, you would. Uh, have a lower viscosity for material one, and then for them, ah,、uh, through, um, through increase the ah、uh, school RPM or school diameters, you could also raise up the processing temperature as we learned earlier in this course. When you increase the temperature, you will decrease the ah、uh, the viscosity of the plastics. All right. Here is the example that I would like all of you to work on. This is for extruding a high density polyethylene with a density of around point nine five zero gram per cubic centimeter, and you are extruding this through a rectangular die. Uh, uh, at one hundred ninety Celsius, the die channel is about one hundred fifty two point four millimeter wide. Six millimeter high and hundred millimeter long. The you can find the viscosity in this plot of these materials. And again, at one hundred ninety, the melt density is about a point seven six one two. And I want you to calculate the shear rate in the die channel and the pressure drop across the channel. Assume you have a hundred kilogram per hour production rate. Uh, and we assume high density polyethylene is material one in this plot. One hint for you is if you using these equations, the, this is Q. Remember, Q is the volumetric output. What I give you is a hundred kilogram per hour, and that's math for output. So you need to convert a hundred kilogram per mole to the volume output. And you apparently you guys know right? Mass is related to volume through the density. And in this case, at one hundred and ninety, you should use the density point seven six one two. So once you convert one hundred kilogram per hour to the volume, you can plug in this equation. Find out the shear rate. With the shear rate you calculated, which should be around forty, and then you can. Uh, estimate the、uh, the viscosity of your materials at this temperature. Then you can plug in your numbers to calculate the、uh, the pressure drop、uh, using this equation. And I will upload my、uh, solutions on detail, and you can、uh, look a little over. All right. Hopefully today you learn something about the extruder extruder, and then next time I will show you how to operate the extruder in the lab. Bye.